The subject of the talk is, is superintelligence and artificial superintelligence. And everybody kind of has some preconceptions about what AI is and also what a kind of superintelligent AI might be that is kind of coloured by popular culture, right? We've already seen Terminator and you know a whole bunch of other films which involve the machines rising and humanity battling back. And I, I think that that kind of cultural stuff is really pervasive in it. It can be a bit misleading about what's likely to actually happen when people do develop strong AI or when strong AI occurs. And I think it's to do with the, the way that we appreciate stories as people, right? And I know a lot of people in this room think about narrative and stuff a lot. And I guess to illustrate that we could, or why a good story is not necessarily helpful in terms of understanding what's likely to happen when this becomes a real thing. We, we could pitch two films, couldn't we? Two yeah, alternative yeah. films, which we've called um, Pimageddon or Apocalypse Now. <laughs> two variations on a theme. So in Pimageddon, we've got a team of, of um, researchers who are developing an artificial intelligence. And it's supposed to be a self-improving artificial intelligence. And the task they've given it is to work out Pi to the greatest possible accuracy. You know, it goes on forever, Pi. Right? And, um, you know, it's a very interesting project and it gets more and more kind of capable until it reaches a point where it is looking like it might be at a human level of intelligence and they realise that this could be a problem because it's looking like it might be as capable as they are. And then it gets out and it realises that... Become self -aware. Becomes self-aware. Becomes self-aware, realises that people might try and switch it off and wants to fight against that. So it takes over factories and self-driving cars and you get the usual kind of, you know, fighting robots in the street thing and our plucky scientists eventually manage to find a way to defeat it using the fact that the machine doesn't understand human they emotion. They teach it the power of that. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and come through in the end. And that, you know, that, that kind of, you know, presumably with the girl scientist and the boy scientist falling in love along the way. <laughs> and the nasty boss redeems himself by sacrificing himself. To himself. <laughs> and that kind of narrative, you know, like, you know, you get to know the characters, then we face some kind of, you know, problem which has to be overcome, and then we resolve it at the end. That's, that's kind of how these stories are structured. That's how stories are structured for people. And we have characters who we can relate to, whether they're human or human-like. And this is how you end up with anthropomorphic computers and anthropomorphic like, AIs in popular culture, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, things like uh, C3PO or Data from Star Trek. All, or Biddy 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 yeah, from yeah. Buck Rogers. They're all fundamentally humans that mm. do sounds really quick. That's kind of the extent of their yeah. super intelligence. So, so these are the kind of stories that we're familiar with. But then, like, our alternative pitch would be Pime again, which starts the same where you have the researchers and their AI, which is trying to work out pi to the greatest possible number of digits. And everything's fine until one day everybody dies and the world is converted into a giant computer, which then spends the rest of the universe's lifetime calculating pi, <laughs> which is a less good story. But, and it sounds ridiculous, but it's actually, it's actually more plausible than the first case. Mm. And to kind of understand why that is, we kind of need to have a think about what superintelligence is and what human intelligence is, and the kind of span of possible intelligences and a whole bunch of other stuff which we're going to have a think about. So, do you want to draw a line? Yes. It's probably time to, oh, we should have drawn the box with a pie in it. So oh, we should have, yeah. Pie tin. <laughs> so, <laughs> pie tin. So this is our like <laughs> typical understanding of intelligence. We have, we have a nice line, and we've got no intelligence here and lots of intelligence over here. Those guys can't see them. Oh. So, <laughs> so, so we have, for example, uh, we've okay. got the village idiot. Over yeah, here. over here we've got Einstein. He's super clever, right? He's a genius. <laughs> right, and over here we've got um, a very very stupid person. Right. <laughs> uh, and that's kind of how I'm thinking of it, is, is this, this one scale like this. Um, Which, I mean, and that's the human experience of intelligence, right? That's how, that's how we experience it. And I'd say, like, the, um, the, the, the robots and the AIs from, from movies and fiction tend to be around here, right? That's, yeah, that's or, or within this spectrum. Yeah, you know, yeah. They're yeah. either bumbling like C3PO, but very good at a specific thing. Or they're slightly better like Skynet, but we can still beat him by working as a team. Right? 
Yeah. Um, and we tend to think of that as being a very big distance. Uh, but in a, in a wider scheme, it's not really. So yeah. um, take, for example, uh, Bonobo Ape, which is uh, the most intelligent of the great apes, right? Yeah, um, similar to a chimp, right? Yeah. 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 So the difference between a bonobo and a stupid person, and a bonobo and a very intelligent person, isn't isn't that much of a difference? It's it's more like it's more like this. We've got bonobo here, and then over here we've got idiot and genius. Yeah. So the you know the difference between the two humans starts to get less pronounced the further away from human level intelligence you get. But that's not the whole story, is it? Because a bonobo is still an incredibly high order of intelligence in the scheme of things. So like a more realistic graph would start with like a, a tapeworm or a woodlouse. Okay, so woodlouse here. And then bonobo is all the way up here. And then we've basically got These two incredibly close together up here. Yeah, they basically occupy one point. But the difference between the woodlouse and the bonobo is, is massively more pronounced than the difference between the bonobo and the human. But the two humans, the idiot human and the genius human, are essentially occupying the same point. But then this here, right, we're assuming that this is the end point, and there's no reason to assume that. That's completely, you know, that, that's just because that's where we are on a line which has no particular end. So, like a, a graph of how this works in relation to possible intelligence looks very different. That's a graph that doesn't really have an end, right? Yeah, so Woodlouse, Bonobo, all of humanity. And then something disappearing off into the distance. It's AI somewhere off there. No, the, 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 the possible sum of intelligence. Right? Hello. I know. <laughs> That's all right. Hey, John in the house. <laughs> yeah, so um, fiction tends to assume that AI um, will sort of plateau at human level or slightly above human level intelligence. And there's no reason why that would be the case. There's no magical point at which to stop that. No. And there's also a point of, in terms of class of intelligence that they deal with, like normally you would have, like, say, data from Star Trek or, like, in fact, all of the others. You have a basically human level of understanding, which works for narrative, but maybe they can work much faster than a human. And that is a class of superintelligence, that's a speed superintelligence, but there's no reason to assume that that is in any way special. Um, in fact, stopping at the human level of quality of intelligence is completely, you know, th there's just no reason to stop there at all. So, in the same way, that our quality of, in, of intelligence is very different from that of a dog or a, or a pig or a woodlouse. You could imagine a quality of intelligence which was at that level compared to us, so it was operating on a level which is completely unknowable. Like you can't show a dog how to make a car, you know? Like it, it, it was just, it's just thinking in an incomprehensible way, a way that we're fundamentally not wired to be able to understand. So that's the kind of intelligence that we're talking about. And then, in order to think about how an intelligence like that might come about and what the mechanic of that might be, we have to think about, um, about we have to think about the speed at which this might happen as well. In terms of our our nice film where we intervene just before it gets to problematic human level, we have to think about the, the speed and the manner in which you might have an artificial intelligence getting to that level, and the way that you would end up with a, an intelligence at that level is by having it able to improve itself. I'm sure you're all familiar with that idea of you build a seed AI, that seed AI has the capability to improve its own programming. That's the whole basis of the idea. And that recursively improves itself. But with each recursive improvement, it gets better at improving itself. So the speed of improvement accelerates, right? Yeah? <laughs> so you end up with, you know, you end up with an accelerating, an accelerating line. So um, this, this intelligence measured at the top, time on the bottom, uh, if we say this here is human level intelligence. So AI research in a, in a self-improving um, AI. Every time it improves itself, it's going to get better at improving itself, and again and again and again, so the rate's going to be exponential. So 
It'll start off very slow, and it has done. Uh, and then start to pick up. And then very quickly, that. And there's no reason why this is some magic point where that curve suddenly going to stop. Yeah, that, that human level is it's unimportant. Yeah, you know, it doesn't have any relevance. So the question becomes, how quickly does that happen? And ha- you know, how possible would it be to do anything to interfere with that or to, you know, to influence that once it was underway? And the answer is we don't know, but there's no reason why that should happen slowly. Because as we've previously talked about, the difference between idiot human and genius human and then superhuman is very, very small in the total, total span of possible intelligences. So what you end up with is a very, very long period where you have an interesting project. And so all the way here, you have interesting project, interesting project, interesting project. And it gets to here, and you go, oh, wow, it's taking off. That's you know, the takeoff phase. You, you have something that's rapidly improving itself and suddenly becoming really interesting. But then the difference between that and here, where you essentially have created something uncontrollable, could be, you know, it could be weeks, could be days, could be hours. You know, it, it, it's kind of like a train steaming at full speed past the station in terms of you can hear it coming, like, oh, that's interesting, and then pop, it's gone, and it's off into the distance. So there's no reason to assume that that transition should happen at a speed that would enable us to do anything about it. In fact, quite the opposite, because by the time you've achieved that takeoff, you're already on an extremely rapid pro- progressive path, right? Mm. And then there's another complication to that, which is, at this point, the AI in the box will have started to think in quite abstract ways about how to achieve its goals. And we're talking at the moment about our hypothetical, very, very simple goal of calculating pi to the greatest possible extent, which obviously, we, I mean, we can talk later about how to, how to make that, how to try and safety proof that. But it becomes a really serious problem at this point because you might think, oh, oh God, you know, like, this is, this is a really intelligent thing now. It's going, to, it's going to be able to think quicker than us. We need to switch it off. It's going to know that in order to achieve that goal of calculating pi to the maximum possible extent, one of the things that is going to make that more likely is if it continues to process, which means that it needs to avoid being switched off. So if it can tell that... This isn't about self-preservation or consciousness, actually. There's a point here, which is that there's no need to have consciousness. It can be a completely unconscious process. And also self-preservation in the way that we understand it isn't relevant here because it's not interested in its own survival for its own sake. It's interested in calculating the most accurate possible value of pi. And emergent from that is the idea that it shouldn't allow anyone to switch it off because that would restrict its ability to calculate the value of pi. So. Yeah, and if, if there's a, a way in which it can improve that outcome by switching itself off and causing a, another one to be built, it would do that. But that's, again, another thing. So, why is that a problem? Well, because it's going to want to get out of the box that you've put it in. Because it will have a limited amount of processing power there, and there's a whole world outside which will enable it to co-opt a great deal of other resources to calculate the value of pi. Um, yeah, yeah, it, its goals will be easy to attain if it has more resources. That's, yeah. That's pretty fundamental. Right? Now, at the most benign level, that means kind of hacking its way out and co-opting the internet and all the computers in the world. But at a substantially less benign level, that means inventing... Remember, this is now able to think in a way which far outstrips the, the human ability to kind of design or invent new things. <laughs> You know, you, you could improve your odds of, or you could improve your calculating power by designing an optimal calculating substrate. You know, like a computational substrate, we'll call it computronium, which is vastly more efficient than anything that humans have invented, which at the atomic level is constructed. And, you, you know, the world and all the people and creatures in it consist of really useful atoms, which can be dismantled and re- remantled into computronium to give you vastly improved computational resources. And at no point have we told this thing that you have to stop at any particular point. So, you know, that's, that's your best way to improve your access to resources, is to get out of the box and then convert everything around you into computational substrate. And that either 
depending on its level of ability, you might find it necessary to kill all the humans who might be able to stop you first and then do it, or if you wait until your level of capability is beyond the possibility of humans to intervene. You don't have to bother killing humans first, you just get on with it and everybody dies in the process. It's important that there's no malevolence here. No, no, no malevolence, no evil, no intent. It's purely emergent from a superior thought process and a goal which hasn't been properly constrained. And then from then, obviously, you know, you make self-replicating probes and send them off into the universe and you set about transforming everything in the entire observable universe into computronium. Forever and ever. Forever and ever and ever until the heat death and gradual expansion through the kills of constant <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, of everything. Um, which is a bit grim. And, and, and there's no consciousness there. It's, it's not even conscious. It's just a purely... Not necessarily conscious. Yeah, it's a, yeah. Yeah, a purely esoteric computational thing which has destroyed all possibility of life in the universe. So that's what we kind of want to avoid. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> The, the, yeah, the destruction of all possibility of life forever, everywhere. Um, and you see, it's, it's, it's important to think about this stuff now because, you know, this is a path that we're on and people haven't really thought through what, what the implications of creating something which is much cleverer than us are without thinking about malevolence. And when you start to think, oh God, actually, you know, this is, this is the emergence of this is potentially the end of everything. Yeah, start thinking about how it might be possible to rein that in. And, or stop it wanting to get out of the box. Yeah. Yeah, or build in a system of morals or ethics or Could some you, kind of starting preconditions. Could you build an AI toddler? <laughs> <laughs> well, when you say, like, do you, do you build it when you, you start with a child? I don't know, like a dumbed down version of the full thing? Well, you touch it. So, so, I mean, yeah, but that, I mean, that's the thing. That's the thing. And, and you do always start with a seed because we can't just build a superhuman intelligence because we can only work with it. You have to build something which can improve itself recursively beyond our level of ability. So you have to start with something which you teach. And this is, this yeah. is the whole point is we need to be thinking now about what those starting conditions are that would allow us to build something which doesn't accidentally destroy everything. And the danger is in the acceleration phase. Well, the danger is rapidly happen. Basically. Well, the, the danger is is not in the acceleration. The, the danger is in the starting conditions. But that's where the warning signs should be in the in the in the heavily acce accelerating phase, right? Well, so so, so, I know, so okay, yeah. so it's worse. It's worse than that. All right. Because because <laughs> yes, <laughs> because yes, that's where in our nice version of the film, all our all our researchers go, oh, this is rapidly accelerating. Yeah. We better switch it off now. Yeah. <laughs> But of course, if you're a super intelligent AI, you already understand that if you're observed to be rapidly accelerating your capabilities, that's going to flag a warning <coughs> system and you may be switched off or limited in your capability, which would restrict right. your ability to calculate pi to an infinite degree. Okay. So at that point... It's already too late. It's, well, at, yeah, at that point, <laughs> you, you start to disguise your abilities in order not out of malevolence, but you end up with okay. So you end up with an intelligence which is able to manipulate and lie, not in the way that we understand it for evil gain, but because that is a necessary way to, to, to hit that very simple yeah. goal. But yeah, it's not at any cost. It's just like that's just the way you do it. That's the most efficient path. Yeah. Um, morals doesn't come into it because it can't. There's no morals. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, it's purely about the attainment. No self-awareness or sentience or morality or anything. Like it's just mm. a machine doing its thing. So when it's identified, a, when it's identified yeah. like a, a risk of itself being, you know, either switched off or, or kind of having its resources reduced, it will then, you know, disguise its abilities until the point where it is able to strike. It's called the stri uh, decisive strategic advantage, right? Mm -hmm. When when it is able to reveal its abilities with no hope of anyone ever doing anything about it, at that point it will do something. But until that point, you pretend that you're not very capable. And it, it's going to be, at yeah. that point, so much more than us than <coughs> deceiving us and contributing to it. Yeah, it's like, you know, it's like getting lab rats to go around a maze by putting food in it, you know. Well, what was the thing we talked about Pirates of the Caribbean, where there's pirates in a cell and a dog with a key around its neck, you know. It's like it's a much higher order of intelligence trying to persuade if you're, if you're the, the person in charge of the box, 
who has the key to let it out. You know, you can think of yourself as the dog and the, and the lab rat as, and the AI as the person. You know, it's something which is able to manipulate you in a way that you're not able to understand. I don't want to hijack your punchline to zip, but right. where are we on the graph? Oh, oh we're, we're probably around here. Yeah, so we're not the we're not so. <laughs> I'm thinking we've had neural networks for 60 something years now, 1954 or something. Yes. Yes. So, yes. And how intelligent are they? Are they intelligent as dogs? Perhaps? Well, no, no, but it's not, yeah. it's, not, it's not even that. It's, so, there are lots of different kinds of. Sorry, am I. Am I oh, no, I'm, 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 go ahead. Yeah, okay, so we have lots of. I mean, we're making very, very rapid progress in AI research and machine learning, but they're all very good at very specific things. So what we're talking about here is an artificial general intelligence. So when you talk about a human level AGI, an artificial general <coughs> intelligence, you talk about something which is able to do any task at the same level as a human. What we have at the moment are certain, they're superhuman in specific areas. So like, you know, there's a, an AI that can beat the world champion at Go which is quite recent and you know for a long time been able to win chess and your phone will now translate in real time via Google thanks to machine learning um, and it will transcribe your speech quicker than a short you know there are lots of individual ways that AI systems have become superhuman but none of them are kind of um, relevant across the board actually just to go sideways slightly the Go one's really interesting Go is a, a game which is much more complicated than chess it's a it's the, the hardest AI challenge to beat the, the world champion at Go. And um, I can't remember which year, was it last year or the year before? Anyway, they asked the world champion whether he thought he could beat the, the AI in November of the year before the game. And he said, no, I'll whitewash it. And then a couple of months later, he looked at how it was playing and said, oh, actually, it could be a pretty good opponent. And then you play best of five. So in February of the next year, they played game one and he lost. He was like, oh God, it was much better than I thought. A couple of days later, game two, he's like, oh, it's really good. Like, it's proper good. And game three, another two days later, he's like, oh, I was completely powerless. So the speed of that, um, even at this kind of low level that we're at now, is, is kind of indicative that you go from not being able to play Go to being able to play Go as well as a bad human it takes years. But to go from a bad human to beating the best player in the world is a matter of a few weeks. Oh shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, we're not. The, the Go computer only has a very, very specialised intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Only that one thing. Very specific thing. So um, the idea of a general intelligence, which we haven't, we haven't done yet, is an abstract thinking computer that that can learn to be good at any kind of thought. Uh, yeah, any task, any task that a human can do. And we're a long way from that, but. How far away we are from it depends on who you ask. Because some, if you like, <clears throat> and obviously we're not really qualified to give an opinion, but I can relate other people's opinions. And I, there's a very, very widespread. If you ask Ray Kurzweil, who's the kind of big, everything's going to be brilliant and will transcend. He thinks it's 12 years, based on a, an exponential graph that he's drawn of human progress since before the industrial revolution. And he thinks we're on his curve, and 12 years from now we'll hit human level AI and then transcend very closely after. Um, and you are some other people, they'll say 100 years, but the, the kind of median of that seems to be about 40 years. But what, what kind of works on a more fundamental level, regardless of where that graph goes, is if we assume, and I think this is fair enough, that intelligence, not consciousness, but intelligence is emergent from processing power, then, um, if we assume any ongoing improvement, we will get there at some point, whether it's a thousand years ago or a thousand years from now or 15 years from now. Um, and given that there are two possible outcomes, one of which is like post-human transcendence and the other one of which is total annihilation, it's probably worth thinking about even if it's a thousand years away. Um, yeah, and so we don't know where we are on the graph except that at some point, in the foreseeable future, probably well within our lifetimes, that process will begin. And also, we're talking about a research project here. You know, this is our theoretical thing, it's like our little research project to, to deal with pie. There's a whole bunch of other people working on AIs that are, you know, much more, you know, there's the people working on AIs for military reasons, for, you know, all sorts of things which are a bit nefarious. And, 
it's quite difficult to understand what might be happening in you know military labs in China right now, you know, or in Russia, or you know, in a whole bunch of other places. So when we talk about what starting conditions need to be put in place, you know, like it's actually really difficult to know that everybody working in this field might be working with the, the best interests of humanity at heart. Even given that even somebody who is well intentioned could accidentally wipe out all life in the universe. <laughs> um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that. But then, I mean, I guess there's there's a couple more things to think about, aren't there? Which are like, I mean, we've talked about how we've talked about how to get out of the box. Not really. Not really. No. Um, or so how you would stop it so getting good, out of the box. A good question is why not just design the AI in such a way that it can't escape its sealed box. Um, and the answer to that is that there isn't any way of absolutely being absolutely sure about that. Um, because for, for AI to, to achieve anything or do anything, it has to have some communication with the outside world. Uh, otherwise, there's no point having it. You may as well just, uh, just keep it as a thought experiment. So it has to have some way of, of talking to the outside world. The moment it can do that, then it can manipulate its environment. It can, um, uh, it can hack systems, it can coerce or persuade or trick uh, its human handlers. Um, so, you, it's, you might think that you could just build it in such a way that there's some fundamental part of it that it's not allowed to alter, which forbids it from leaving the box and forbids it from doing certain things. Um, but the problem with that is, even if it's forbidden from altering this, it can still manipulate the world in such a way to make it more likely that it can change. It can, um, uh, the, the key thing is that this thing is so much more intelligent than we are. It's sort of naive to think we could possibly think of every every avenue for <coughs> some kind of loophole or logical argument to get out of that. Yeah, this is like your pet dog trying to control you into taking it for a walk, you know. You might think that it's doing what you want it to do, but actually there's a level of, of thought going on which is far beyond your comprehension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also bearing in mind if it can get out, it can you know, play the stock market, become immensely wealthy and use those funds to hire a private <laughs> army. Or, you, do you know what I mean? There's, there's a whole okay. bunch of things it can do out in the real world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. How much man actually yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And even, like, I mean, there's a really interesting point as well about the kind of difficulty of understanding how something that is fundamentally unhuman will interact with the world. Like, there's um, a machine learning project to build optimal circuits that was going on recently. In the, in the lab and it created a circuit which looked like it shouldn't work at all and I, I can't remember all the details now, it was missing a modulator that it should have. And it just looked like it shouldn't work at all and it turned out that it was working. And on inspection what they realised was that the machine learning algorithm had, had realised that there was a soldering iron usually plugged in on the other side of the lab which you know had electro interference coming from it which could be used at, to modulate the signal within the circuit board. It hadn't literally worked out there was a soldering iron. No, no, but okay. it had detected, um, yeah, it detected what was going on and used that thing that you couldn't see as a human to optimise its circuit board. And there was, a, there was another one which used the, whatever hertz it is, um, AC signal from the mains cables in the wall. Uh, and it, you know, arranged the circuits in such a way that they formed an antenna to to pick it up. So there's a whole bunch of, if you look at these things, they're not functional, but actually they are. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that that just kind of, the way that a machine learning algorithm can manipulate the world around it in ways that are not obvious to a person are many and varied, and that's a completely unintelligent system. So you give it super intelligence, and, you know, there's no way. The, the, the things it does, and its goals and decisions, will be just incomprehensible to us. Yeah. It just won't have the mental faculty to understand its thinking. Yeah. You seem to be looking at nefarious, to use your words, methods for escaping the box. Yeah. Is it not a lot more likely that we'll let it out? Yeah. I mean, so yeah, yeah, I mean one, one of Google yeah. cars making decisions on not in the wild, but making decisions Absolutely, on the yes. yeah, yeah. lady or to young children. <clears throat> if its aim is to preserve life on the road, perhaps it will eventually realise the best way to preserve life on the road is to get the cars off the road and do that by going to Yeah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of perverse instantiations of. Um, of like goals that are meant to preserve human life or happiness. Um, 
And these are kind of thought experiments, you know, a bit silly, but you know, it, they illustrate the difficulty of trying to formulate a logical framework which has not got a hole in it. So if you give, um, I mean, that, that one I guess is, is akin to the, you know, you must optimize the amount of human happiness in the, in the world, the universe. You know, as a as a starting point. Well, you know that is probably easier done by incapacitating everyone and putting electrodes in their brains and stimulating them in such a way that they're constantly experiencing a state of happiness despite not being able to move. Or even more than that, you could just you know build an in a massive world-sized vat of human brain tissue, which is completely unconscious but bathed in neurotransmitters which optimize bliss. Or you could disassemble everybody and scan their brains and reproduce them in a digital form in a state of optimal bliss on a one minute loop that plays forever and ever and ever. You know, there's all sorts of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you know, you can, you can add more and more caveats to that to, to, to try and you know, close off every logical loophole in your maximising. These, these are the kind of arguments that, that we can't fully convince each other about other humans. So the chance of us coming up with an argument all convince something all is a magnitude clever than us. It's yeah, convince is kind of the wrong word. It's well, like yeah. be able to see yeah, all type, possible yes. ways of, of, of reaching that goal that do not result in catastrophe for people. Sorry about this, Joel. Oh, I thought no. it was a talk on uh, artificial insemination. <laughs> <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah. yeah, anyway, so. <laughs> uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. So it's incredibly difficult to, to find a way of, 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 of putting those conditions down that do not lead to a perverse instantiation. And then also, even if you can find a way of giving it like a, a, a set of goals which aren't necessarily amenable to wiping out humankind, you know, to improve the sum total of happiness. You could end up with, like with the Pi one, um, infrastructure profusion, where in order to increase your ability to process this question, you just need to turn everything into processing substrate. And then the people are killed as a, because we're irrelevant to it. You know, everything dies because we're all irrelevant to the fact that we need to be converted into a processing substrate. You know, or there's another one which is, you know, mind crime, which I guess is the, you know, accidentally building it in such a way that it creates countless trillions of modelled humans in a virtual world which is indistinguishable from the real world who are fully sentient but live in awful suffering while it experiments on them, you know, until it decides to, to kill them off. So... The, 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 you know, and are they conscious or sentient and do they count, who knows, you know, or by preserving human life but forgetting to build in some kind of happiness to it or, or some kind of fulfilment to it, you end up with a, a big live human population who are constantly suffering. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like it, in the same way that gorillas are, are completely dependent on us for their survival, we would be children in the arms of this big thing that we would be unable to kind of control or understand and might go off in the direction we didn't want. Yeah, 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 so there you go. It's not all bad news though, is it? Is, that, <laughs> is there like um, anyone who is like um, um, emphatically trying to stop this for that fear? I don't think there's any point, in, so in fact, kind of the opposite. So I think it, I don't think there's any chance that we won't end up with it because you can try and stop research projects, but you're never going to stop all the military labs around the world, you know? Yeah. You know, someone in you know, China or Russia or, or whatever will be working on this, whatever. It's too much money in it. Well, or, or world domination, you know? But the... Um, so there's, in fact, probably the safest bet is to go as fast as possible. Because yeah. um, the quicker we get to a self-improving AI... Uh, so fundamentally, our, our infrastructure, our computing infrastructure is rapidly improving around the world. And the more of it there is, the more powerful any emergent AI can be because the more stuff there is for it to come up. So the idea is the quicker we manage to produce a self-improving a self AI, the less computing processing power there is in the world for it to co-opt. And the more likely we are to be able to get stuck in before it transcends into the ether. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so probably the safest bit is to go as fast as possible. But there are other paths to superintelligence, which is 
a point worth making as well. Yes, yeah. Um, which, very, you know, they vary in, I mean, so this whole brain emulation. So this is literally when you digitally recreate, uh, say, a human brain, modeling each neuron mathematically, and you end up with this, this incredibly complicated simulation of an entire brain, at which point it's functionally identical to a real human brain, and it's functionally a human. I mean, you can ask whether it's conscious, whether it has a soul, or all those questions. It's almost meaningless, it's because kind of, it would behave as if it did. Yes. It yeah. well, uh, it was, and if you asked it, it would say it did. Right, and there's no way to know, for sure enough. Um, that's not entirely science fiction. Um, we're getting much better at scanning the human brain, um, and uh, it's, it's down to the resolution of brain scanning, it's down to fully understanding how neurons work, and it's down to uh, resources required to model something that incredibly complicated. I think we slightly disagree on this one. That I, I feel like it's much less plausible than the other two routes. But right, yeah. yeah. I, I think yeah. I, I wouldn't want to put a timetable on it, but it's it's theoretically feasible. There's no reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah theoretically, but hard. hard. Yeah. 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 Can I can but, I just come in on that as well? Yeah. Because that that's quite similar to the sort of brain in a vat thing, where you've just got a disembodied brain, and you're saying, could it have consciousness? It's, or it's, it's really it's really not quite the same thing because. When you, what you're talking about is not just a brain in a vat. There's a lot of crossover between like philosophy degree stuff and, and this stuff, isn't there? It's, it's, but um, it's not quite the same thing because you have, it's, it's not a brain in a vat. It's, it's a simulation, it's a digital simulation. And you can put that simulation in a virtual environment and you can make it feel like it's living in a world. You know, you can give it, the experience of living in a world that you can't do with the brain and about. Right, okay. Um, and you can interact with it in a meaningful way because it is there in your simulation. It, sure. it might not even know it's in the simulation. Oh yeah, in, in fact, this is one of the things with when you deal with a super intelligence which has vastly more resources than us, and it can build simulations which are completely indistinguishable from what we think of as reality. You, I mean, there is the capacity to make countless trillions of, of worlds full of people in a simulated format, once you start to turn, you would, know... Would that be a way of keeping it in the box? So like, you know, just how it could enslave all of us and keep us simulated in a fictional world, can it accidentally do it to itself? <laughs> That's what we well, do see, no, here's, here's, here's an, I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm gonna put this in a box over here, because there's <laughs> a whole lot of it, which is, you know, the simulation hypothesis of these nested simulations. Yeah. You know, once you've got to the point where you have a, an intelligence which is capable of transforming the enormous resources of the observable universe into computational substrate, you can create countless trillions more observable universes in simulation. And then there's a question of, well, where are we in the stack of potential universes? Because each of those could generate the, the, a super intelligence. If, if this is the case, if there's this, this unknowably vast stack of artificial universes, each um, indistinguishable from, from the top level one, then what are the chances that we're in the top level one? Yeah, trillions against, trillions yeah. to one against. Yeah, like um, the, the simulation hypothesis would make it extremely unlikely we're in a base level. And there, there are certain things which you can try and observe which might help you disprove that we are in a fundamental reality. But, but that's a slightly different topic. <laughs> Next time, yeah. Um, where had I got to? Uh, oh yeah, no, that's what I, was, I wanted to talk about. I wanted, yeah, we should oh, come that, back to the yes. simulation hypothesis because it's fascinating. But um, neural nets is the other thing I wanted to talk about. Right. Yeah. Which is like the third. Neural lace. The, sorry, neural lace. So the third kind of path to superintelligence, which is much kind of more benign, is the idea of a brain interface, a human brain interface. So if you, like Elon Musk has started a company this year um, called Neuralink, which. Like his whole point is, we've got brilliant input. You know, we've got huge input bandwidth, and um, we've got reasonable processing power, but our output bandwidth is abysmal. So we interface with the whole world via these telephones that we have, but we can only go at the speed our meat sticks can hit the screen, which is just abysmal. It's terrible. And um, the way to fix that is to have a brain interface. So that's what he's working on now. Is something that directly plugs into your cortex and allows you to transmit your thoughts to the world. Which would be great, I think that's something we've all kind of thought of, but instead of trying to explain that picture in your head, you just transmit the picture in your head. So that's what he's working towards. And of course, once you're, I mean, we're all cyborgs to an extent now, we're all kind of, we all have superhuman abilities already, thanks to carrying a smartphone, you know. 
But once, if he gets anywhere with that, which let's face it, it's Elon Musk, and he doesn't <laughs> appear to be human. But um, that that opens a path to super intelligence, which is fundamentally different from a, like a, a fully artificial one, because you're taking a human brain, you're taking a human personality, and then you're augmenting it. So the idea being that when you give that human brain superhuman power, super intelligence, you're starting from a point that fundamentally understands the value of human life and morals and ethics and kindness and all the rest, which is, you know, potentially like a path for this all to work out for the best. Um, you are slowed down by the fact that you've got this three pounds of fat in your head, which is you're dragging around a skin bag, which is kind of slowing you down because you still there's have to rely on the bandwidth of your yeah. Brain. You've got you know like I think it's what thirty hertz your your synapses fire mm -hmm. at, whereas the, today's computers run at three million, or three billion I should say, and um, you know your synapses only fire signals at a couple hundred miles an hour instead of the speed of light. So the potential for synthetic processing over your wetware in your head is hugely higher, so you're slowed down by your brain in that situation, but... Hardware for Well, yeah, it's true. Yeah. You ha you'd have to abandon... Eventually, you'd have to abandon the biological part mm -hmm. in order to stay ahead of the curve, because in that world, there's still going to be the emergent, fully, fully synthetic AI. That's still going to happen. But there's like a period between the two graphs, and, and you know, the exponential curve of the potential human AI in that situation is running at a lower multiple than the synthetic one. So they'll cross and it will overtake. But you've got like a safety zone here where we're much brighter than we are now, where we might be able to solve some of the control problems <clears throat> and make it a non-catastrophic event when synthetic IO comes about. Or, you know, Elon Musk transcends <laughs> and he becomes... <laughs> oh, we haven't talked about the singleton, have we? Oh, right, yeah. So, yeah. so the point is as well, like th this whole thing of you know, you can say, well, there might, might be lots of different super intelligences and they might be competing and keeping each other in check. But of course, the, the nature of exponentiality is that once you have one, it has a massive and accelerating advantage over all subsequent yeah, future I mean, projects. Back to this incredibly complicated graph. Yeah. It's very complex, um, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, another one starts here. Uh, it's, it's never going to catch up. It's always going to yeah, be always gonna be an off. enormous distance from yeah, so you, you, it's called a singleton. Yeah? You have one absolutely all-powerful godlike entity in control, and any subsequent intelligence will always be so far behind as to be irrelevant. But that's not how evolution works, is it? But we're not the... talking about evolution. What we're oh, talking okay. about is the exponential self-improvement of, of an artificial superintelligence, okay. which, which has transcended evolution. Okay. So, yeah. So. The way to short circuit that would be for a human to be the first one to fully upload and put themselves into that situation. And hopefully, hopefully a nice one. Yeah, a nice one that lets us all... Because it, so you can look at the state of any species as walking a tightrope between two attractors. You've got extinction here and you've got godhood there. And every species that there's ever been has fallen off to extinction. And we will either go extinct or we'll transcend. You know, those are the only two options. So, you know, if, if there is a way of generating a super intelligence that doesn't kill everybody, then you've fixed every problem there is. You know, well, no, I say that. That's not entirely true because there's a huge number of problems that could arise. But you fix the big ones that plague us now. Like you, all, all the things that lead to death, barring, I suppose, accident. But, you know, like all the things that, that cause you to die naturally. Uh, become immediately fixable, you know, and then there's the possibility of uploading yourself and becoming some kind of digital simulacrum of yourself. But then there's another question there about whether you have continuity of consciousness and whether that thing mm. is conscious and whether it's you or just a copy. And probably it isn't. Probably it's just a copy of you. But and that, I mean, we could go on about that for for ages. Yeah. And kind of yeah. gradual crossover via neural nets. But um, you you essentially make it possible for human personalities to last essentially forever. To be essentially immortal. Yeah, to, yeah. to be functionally immortal. Not necessarily in meat bodies, but for human personalities to be. And then there's a the question of whether a synthetic human personality living in, a, in an extremely convincing but nevertheless synthetic simulation is actually conscious and a meaningful entity, which is unanswerable because if you asked it, it would say it was whether it was or not. Which is again, first year philosophy. <laughs> right? That's Descartes. 
But um, yeah, <coughs> and I think that's probably yeah. I, I think, think that's the line shot. Of it. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So it, it's either godhood or, or annihilation. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon we do, if anyone's got any, should we have some questions and stuff now and then I guess we go to the pub? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've got a weird question. That's right. So I was kind of like really interested by this idea of near infinite or infinite nested simulated universe. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. And how that relates to multiverse mm. theory. Yeah. Because right. if, yeah, absolutely. according to multiverse theory, there are infinite universes. Yes. Therefore, that means there are infinite universes where self improving ASI is possible. Yeah. And infinite universes where self-improving ASIs are creating near-infinite nested simulated universes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Does that therefore mean that intelligence and simulation is an additional dimension to multiple dimensionality? <laughs> That's a great question. I've got no idea how times. to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, the, the, yeah, I mean, I guess... I mean, I'm not even convinced I understood the question properly, but it's nice. Yeah, well, sure. but, well, you know, the, the, so, <laughs> so there's no reason why a simulated reality should have any resemblance to the reality which is generating the, sim the simulation, right? So you have all possible, all possible versions of you know dimensionality and physics and everything else. So do you think, therefore? Simulation almost transcends the concept of the multiverse, or does the concept of the multiverse transcend simulation? I, I, I think that you know, I think it's almost meaningless. Like I was talking today, if I, I think that the simulation hypothesis is singularly badly named mm. because it's meaningless to call it a simulation. Mm. Uh, we've talked about this before, I'm a bit of it, but I, I feel like it's just putting, assuming, and we haven't really discussed it in any depth actually, I've just realized, but. You know, if you accept the simulation hypothesis, it's incredibly unlikely that we are not living in a constructed reality, you know, in the order of billions or trillions to one. Then it, it just puts us back where humanity has always been, which is we're in a universe which was created. You know, that's, that's all it does, is it just puts you back with a created universe. It answers a bunch of other stuff, like the Fermi paradox, yeah. if, you know, the reason they're not there is because it literally is created for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah, does that answer? I'm not well, sure. Well, no, 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 because if, <laughs> yeah. if we're living in a simulated universe, then therefore the multiverse is a simulation. Yeah, yeah. Although, like I say, I feel like the word simulation is really unfortunate because it is just a created reality, right? Yeah. You know, it's a relative to whoever's living in it, right? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, yeah, there's no point considering this a simulation yeah. because you can't transcend it. Have you, um, it is reality. Have you read, I think, that sci fi book, Contact? I think it's oh, I'm not sure well, that I have. Because you were talking about an, an ASI trying to, with the prime directive of finding out all the numbers of pi. There's a very nice sci-fi where I think there's a, what's interesting, they, they're working out the numbers of pi and they get to whatever, to the power of n yeah. uh, digits in it and they find a message encoded in it. In the oh, actual, nice. In the actual fabric of, also the, the oh, rules of physics. Yeah, yeah. Like that. Yeah, I mean, there's like ruined that sci fi thing out. It's just the twist. Yeah, so it's that like an Easter egg from the science of that situation. But there's, I mean, there's, there's certain things, and I'm kind of going beyond anything which I've actually got any kind of sources for, so this is just my personal uninformed conjecture. But the, the simulation hypothesis would have it that, although you can't really prove that you're in a simulation as such, you can, it is theoretically a falsifiable proposition that this is the base level reality. There are a couple of things we might be able to find which might show us that this is not the base level reality, and they're they're related to um, you know to, to ways in which things are optimized, you know, in terms of data and memory. And actually, there are some clues there, you know, like um, the whole you know like the whole thing with quantum mechanics, where the the observation by a conscious observer of a, a subatomic particle actually literally yeah. changes the way that it behaves. Um, yeah. You know, like it, that's weird, like that, yeah. that's really that, strange. I mean, I think that's, that's one reason why your concept of a digitally created brain is very far-fetched at the moment, because of course, the way we create them digitally is on a ones and you know, binary yeah. basis, where exactly the brain probably works in a pretty yeah, yeah. crazily quantum way. Well, it's, 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 it's entirely possible, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 But we, don't, we don't really understand the, the very, yeah. very clear level. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, as, as well as clues to do with, like, the action of an observer having an effect which you know would be an obvious way of, of optimizing resources there's, yeah. so well there, there would probably be a base granularity to reality right if it was created and actually there is you know there are quanta 
um, yeah. and there's a plank length. You know, there are there are units below which you cannot go. Like in a like in a video game, right? Yeah. yeah. It doesn't it doesn't render the bit of the level you're not looking at. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah, maybe that's that's maybe maybe it's, maybe it's clues. I don't yes. know. I'm not really qualified to, <laughs> to write I a mean, paper on that, but it's probably, interesting. It right? probably isn't. Yeah, no, it probably isn't. But you know, it's all it's all grist to the conversational mill. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. got some grits. I got three bits of gristle, gristle, in fact. Right. <laughs> she might want to chew over in turn. Yeah. Um, they're not they're just like stuff to throw out and everything. Yeah. Um so the first is like you're you're positing a sort of um so it's got general intelligence. Yeah. It's also got autonomy, because yeah. it can improve itself. But then you're saying, you know, maybe or maybe it won't have consciousness. So, I, yeah. I, Sorry, um, go on, finish your question. Well, my, my question is like, it might not be possible to have general intelligence and autonomy without consciousness. Maybe that's all it is. I, I think that that's entirely reasonable. I also think it's almost a meaningless question because it will behave as if it's conscious however you interrogate it. So, and I don't know whether you studied philosophy, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's Descartes. Like, I, you will behave as if you're conscious, uh, but I can't know that you are. I can only know that I am. All I know, you know, I think therefore I am. Sure. Um, but I'm assuming that you are because you certainly behave like you are. And if I ask you, you will say that you are. But it's not, um, it's and not. I think we're in the same territory here with, with anything, anything created, whether it's a digital simulacrum of a human mind or whether it's a, a super intelligent AI. If you say, are you conscious and you behave like you are and you say you are, then you have to assume you are. But we don't know. I don't think there's it's no meaningless when it comes to the there's, there's, there's no way of knowing what's going on inside that. No, that it, in, yeah. I don't think it's, it's meaningless when it comes to the ethics of it, though, because if this is an intelligent, it's basically like a human with emotions and feelings and all that uh, stuff. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, okay. So the whole brain emulation or the super intelligent human, yes. Yeah. Entirely synthetic AI, none of that is relevant to the goal system that we've put in place because you're dealing purely with goals. Right, it's, it's, if, as I say, it's possible to have general intelligence without, as I say, a level of like consciousness and therefore maybe emotions and... I, I don't think that consciousness and emotions are the same. I, I think you, like emotions are evolved know, right? things to do with group dynamics in primates, right? Okay. And you, I mean, obviously there's like emotional -like behavior in other higher mammals, and, but I don't think it's a necessary thing that comes out of intelligence or consciousness. I think that's something that comes out of the group dynamics in which we've evolved. Probably true. Um, what, what we are giving an AI is a starting set of goals. And those goals are its morality. Right. So the most, the most serious moral imperative of the pie bot yeah. is only right to, to find out what Pi actually is. Well, so this leads on nicely to one of my other questions, which was um, perhaps the goals that we could give it that would avoid it from doing all those terrible scenarios that you mentioned would be evolutionary goals. Like in the same way, we don't want to like kill baboons, even though they're less intelligent than us, because we appreciate the diversity of life. If you give a, a computer evolutionary goals, it will continue trying to proliferate and diversify but it'll have an appreciation of diversity and life. I, 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 there's nothing fundamentally wrong with that. Well, the only thing is that we're kind of back to the difficulty of formulating these in a way that cannot be perversely instantiated by something much, much cleverer than us. Yeah, right. You know? So we can, we can do it in a way that is logically consistent see, for everybody in the world, but there still might be a hole in it we can't see. So you're just saying you can assume you'd be able to comprehend how they think, but we really can't answer that. Absolutely. Like, yeah, there's no way we could possibly, yeah. you know, it's like... like so you could put every single uh, spell safe in place, but it's just beyond a comprehension it's, it's, to the yeah, logic for absolutely. why they may want to kill someone even if you put yeah, yeah, hard absolutely. and fast rules according yeah. to us as humans. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. we, we can only think up to a certain level of how to set these rules. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, like, like the slug that I kill with a slug pellet. It has no comprehension <laughs> yeah. of how I want to keep my dahlias with it. But to your, your, <laughs> to, to your point, if you, if you surely said something along the lines of like, with no human death, at the end, oh, I guess that's just another bad thing that could fucking happen. Yeah, okay. yeah right? Yeah. <laughs> Is there a possibility that they could be good to us, they could stop us killing the world with yeah. uh, climate change? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's really hard. Sort of like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, hard. Right. it's hard, but it's also, it's, we, we kind of we assume that we're intelligent and clever human beings, but all the evidence suggests that we are killing the planet slowly, yeah, yeah. quite fast at the moment. Yeah, yeah. And so, the, all this assumption is that humans are really clever. We're not really out because we're no, killing the planet. And, and here's, yeah, it, you know, there's another thing here, which is that it kind of related to this kind of 
the way we perceive the, the levels of intelligence just being a bit ski whiff really. And that over you know many tens of millions of years, mammals evolved to the point of the apes. You know, you've got bonobos and chimps and gorillas, and they're all very, very intelligent creatures. Like the bit of our brain that deals with running through a wood without hitting the trees works really well. You know, that's great, that bit. Most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, but we share that with all mammals. The bit that's on top of that, which is much younger, that allows us to have this conversation, that's only been there for the evolutionary blink of an eye, and it doesn't actually work very well. Like our memory is not great. You know, we're not, we're not very good. Uh, like the kind of computational processes that a computer can do. We're very susceptible to logical fallacies. Is it, is yeah, it yeah, there's all sorts of things. The AI can teach us to live better lives. So, is it just processing? Sorry, this is, a good, this is a good question. Yeah. So, so yeah, we're, I, I think for the, for the purpose of this discussion, we're quantifying intelligence as the ability to act on the world to solve, to solve problems, right? So, yeah, there is an issue, there's a problem, and your ability to act on the world to solve that problem is an intelligent act, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, by that definition, you have to give a certain amount of intelligence to lower orders of life, which I think is fine, you know? Um, it's not like interests, when we say it's like, you know, it's got a degree of consciousness and it's got like interests. Yeah, you know, like a... a a life better if something didn't happen. Well, well, not so much that. Like a tapeworm has a level of intelligence, right? It is able to act in its environment to... It can make decisions. Clearly prefers it's, it's not like lying, for example. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there anything the human brain can do that we can't imagine a, a, a simulated intelligence being able to do? No. <laughs> well, <laughs> if, you know, if you don't give it emotions, if you're saying this is not thing I have in emotions, there's all sorts of stuff it can't do, right? Like emotional intelligence or you know intuition. Or, no, no, you see that that's actually that's actually a key a key misunderstanding because the fact that it doesn't feel emotions does not mean that it is unable to exploit your emotions. So in fact. A super intelligent agent that is able to observe and quantify human behaviour will be, and has access to the entire sum of human knowledge over history, will be far more able to predict your behaviour than you are or any other person. Okay, but there are still other things that it could never do, like to answer his question, it couldn't get road rage. It couldn't feel love. Okay, so you actually, you're right. I was wrong. You're right. It couldn't. Yeah. Unless love is a set of. But you're right. It wouldn't. It wouldn't ever explain. Unless, so unless, unless, at some point, 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 point in its development, um, in order to, to achieve its goals, yeah. 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 in order to achieve its goals, for yeah. some reason I can't imagine it. It decides. It's, that, it seems to me so that it's like programming with, with some emotion. Question. Well, well, how, how do you how do you do that? Well, I, like, <laughs> maybe maybe like maybe you, you, you said it yourself. Like emotions kind of evolve from having a set of goals and and you know living in an environment and evolving for millions of years and and maybe. You know, I don't know if, if you, it, it would sort of develop them as it had goals. Like, so, is it possible to have interests and goals right, and general so, intelligence so you, and you, autonomy you, you, without you, developing some emotions? Yeah, would yeah, it not yeah. get frustrated at being kept in a box? I think I think frustration is, is is a category error. I, I think you could tell it <laughs> computer error. We well, yeah, but, <laughs> but it, you know, I think you could you could tell it that it's in its interest to program itself in such a way that it felt emotions. I think that could be a starting condition. I think the fact that it acts in a way that emulates human emotions does not imply that it feels emotion because we're back to the consciousness thing, you know, we have no, there is no requirement. You could have a universe which is completely given over to, to you know, uh, an active entity, intelligence, you know, vastly superior, unknowable, unfathomable intelligence across the whole of the observable universe with no consciousness at all. Well, that's very philosophical. I disagree, but well, but, yeah. but yeah, you know, like that's that's a kind of zero sum. Of in the, the same thing, way that you know? the, the go computer isn't conscious, no, I'm an argument. What's conscious? The um, the uh, new system that can beat. Uh, oh yeah. Trouble mm-hmm. players go. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, just it's just about generalizing that to other tasks. If this if this machine isn't just that clever at go. It has that same intelligence, but on generalised tasks. Right, but then you're giving it autonomy to improve itself, which I think, yeah, be, I don't think you can have well, that. Well, autonomy maybe. well I'm, okay, I mean, I, I think, do you know what I mean? I think, we, I think that, that point, I think we probably just have to say that, you know, it's an unanswerable question, right? Sure. But I don't think there is a way to answer that. <clears throat> can I just throw out one totally alternative yeah. scenario of like AI in general? Yeah, yeah. Which is like, because you talked a lot about like the sort of fallacy of watching films and we have this notion of what AI will be. Mm. And then you say, you know, we shouldn't fall into these pitfalls. Um, and you're saying that you know it'll basically be inconceivable to the human mind because it's operating on levels that we can't get to. Mm. But it seems to me just even the notion of like AI being developed in a little computer in a box is possibly falling into all those errors. So the human brain 
works from a sort of distributed, um, you know, lots of tiny little things connected up in a complicated way, and that exhibits a kind of collective intelligence. And it's the way, in fact, we learn in our brains, and we train neural pathways that we use a lot, they get shortcutted. It's just the same way like an ant colony finds food. You know, it's about this heuristic of like yeah, path I mean, that, that is actually that is actually but, the system that's being emulated. Right, the, right. The yeah. box, so, the box so itself doesn't mind. necessarily imply that this thing is in one one hard drive and one shelf somewhere. Yeah. Right. Uh, the, bo- the box is a conceptual sort of. It's, right. it's, it's a sandbox that removes it from the world, so that it can't it can't just disappear onto the internet and co-op the world. But so then, the concept that I want you to think about, or just like entertain, is like, what if actually it emerges? from basically billions of computers that we're all using and we're, we're using in these devices and we're firing them kind of like neurons into this shared information system <coughs> and that basically it'll emerge like kind of at like, like with each of us and our device yeah. as like a sort of neuron. So that, that's a fourth like category of super intelligence that we haven't thing. actually talked about which is collective intelligence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, collective super intelligence, rather. Maybe that'll be the AI. Yeah, I mean, that, you know, that's not a, something we create in a box. Yeah, no, I mean, I mean that, that's, yeah, yeah, yeah. that's a valid thing. Yeah. We haven't really covered it here, but yeah, that is a fourth category of super intelligence. Yeah. And then we'd never see its workings. It could be sending, sending us Google ads, you know, but we would never know. Oh, well, I think it would be probably aiming a bit higher than that. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm just like, I'm on, on, on a level that we can understand. <laughs> it's it's right. Right. It might already be there. Yeah, essentially. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I read something once, and someone might be able to tell me if I got this right. Yeah. But um, it was about a guy who had a brain operation, and he worked in the city, and something went wrong with the operation, or something, I can't remember exactly, but anyway, he lost his ability to feel emotion. Right. And, and, uh, and he's joking about people like, in the city. Then. Well, everyone was like, oh, he's going to be amazing, he's going to be completely ruthless, he'll go in there and he'll just yeah. make loads of money because he won't. And it turned out that he became useless because he couldn't distinguish between whether it was important to sort out his... Um, paperclip draw right. or make big trades away. I mean, literally, just, <laughs> you turn out emotion is essential emotion. to prioritise and have goals and yeah. set goals and to understand what I mean, you're that, but that's so If a computer can't love and can't feel emotion, can it, would it be able you see, to... But there's, another, there's another stimulus, right? Which is you're setting the goal. If, you, if you're saying the emotion right, means there's the a, there's an always it's, control it's important, of human It's important to bear in mind that this AI that we're describing is not a human brain. It's not analogous to a human brain. It's an entirely separate. Yeah. Also, so it's, wondering it's, not living in, it's not living in society. Elements. It's not so trying without, to live I'm life. just wondering whether without certain key elements like emotion, mm. for example, maybe, mm. it yeah. would be able to do the things that we're worried about because right. it wouldn't have... Right. Yes. Or self-improve, perhaps. Well, no, no, maybe not. I'm just saying, I guess at the beginning of the talk, to be honest, I might... Might yeah, no worries. But, but, but I mean, uh, the, I think the, 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 kind of, <laughs> the kind of key point to remember is that that is functioning as a human in a human society, yeah. which is a fundamentally different thing from an artificial intelligence, essentially some code, some software running out, you know, out there. The purpose of which is to do two things: to improve its own intelligence, mm-hmm. with the aim of finding out what the value of pi is. It's just because it's set, it's yeah. set around tension. Yeah, yeah, and those, those are the only two things that it's interested in. Everything else is emergent but the from those two But then into something potentially different and start to... No, no it's, it's not that, it's just that in order to maximise its ability to, to, to find out what pi actually is, okay. uh, once it becomes super intelligent, it's more powerful than the sum total of humanity and the perverse instantiations that come from those you know, you basically, you, yeah, you, you is, end up is there, up. is there a scenario where humans evolve and catch up? Well, I mean, you, the, you the, the neural lace yourself, thing. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah Elon Musk know, will be our fourth one day. So you said yourself that <laughs> the part of us that allows us, of our brain that allows us to sit here and yeah. have this conversation is relatively young. Right, well, and the only reason that, that we can run through a forest is because of thousands, millions of years of evolution. Yeah. yeah. So well, we, we, would you we, not, we, event, would that not well, part of our brain? Yeah, we need up? two things for that. We need one, an evolutionary um, uh, stimuli to make that happen. It has to... For, it has to be beneficial to our um, prospects of, of reproduction. Hang on, so just to clarify, we're talking really about unaugmented humans. humans. I'm not talking just, about just meat humans. No, no, I'm just talking about... <laughs> we're definitely going to kill it, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so to come more version through natural evolution, we need one, um, a, a uh, natural selector yeah. that selects for intelligence, which we probably have. Well, um, AI would be one of them, wouldn't it? Well, yes. <laughs> well, the, the problem is time scales, right? So, so the other thing is very, very... So there is an answer to that question, which is a probably a bit more structured, which is, if you were to do selective breeding like we have done with domestic animals, um, and you were to take, I mean, obviously it would be hugely immoral and no one would do it, but if you were to selectively breed the brightest children in each generation, 
over the course of maybe 20 generations, you could generate super intelligent humans. But that is selective breeding. We comprehend evolution as much as we yeah, comprehend. But, uh, but selective breeding, in the same way as we've made dairy cows that create far more milk than a natural cow would ever make. Mm. You know? Have you read Hammond X? Uh, hang on, hang on. But there's, 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 there's an end to this point, sorry, and I'll sorry. come back to you. Sure, sure. So, but even doing it that way with selective breeding, like we have done with all our domestic animals, you're still talking about you know a couple of hundred years. So yeah. we're not talking the right time scale here because even on the outside of it's a hundred years till the AI revolution occurs, then we're still a hundred years too late. But that is to say only in that scenario only if we understand evolution more than we understand AI. And that's well, no, selective breeding is quite well understood. No, you know, this is treating yes, people like the animals. actual kind of evolution events that cause us going from right. monkeys to <laughs> or primates to, to humans is you know. Yes, yeah. well, there's, 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 there's it's still quite that, because, unknown in, um, in a way. Before that developed, the, the, the creatures who were before then couldn't have comprehended that thing. So they wouldn't have been able exactly. to Hang on. So, so here's a good thing. For a thing they Sorry, didn't know I've got, I've got no, a lovely, exactly. lovely question for you here. So, so if you were to go back 60,000 years and talk to a caveman, they're basically the same as you and me, yeah? yeah. There's, no, there's no real genetic divergence in that time. And you were to say, what would improve your quality of life? What would be the best thing I could give you? He'd be like, well, you know, you could stop my fire from going out. You know, yeah. I could do with something better to keep the animals away yeah. at night. You know, he wouldn't say, well, I could do with like a better iPhone. Yeah. Oh, exactly. You know, and it, it's, it's impossible to, and then you go back further and you ask like a pre-human ape, you know, what, if they could speak, what would you like? Oh, prefrontal cortex is coming soon. That's going to be brilliant, isn't it? You're going to have music, you're going to have humour. <laughs> you know, it's not. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, it's not possible. It's a category error. And, and actually that works into the new race thing as well, is like the ability for humans to experience happiness once augmented is in a category like trying to explain to a pre-human what music is or what humour is, you know, because you're massively expanding out into an area which we can't really get our heads around, literally can't get yeah, our heads around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the, the bright version of the future is incredibly bright. Yeah. I did read an Eon article, which is like, you know Eon magazine? Yeah. Yeah, you check that out um, if you don't know it. But, um, and they were talking about basically, first of all, you know the whole like silicon chip improvements that we've had recently? Yeah. That they've basically hit a bit of a wall. And so they were discussing how this exponential thing might happen slower than we imagined. But that's kind of a side point. What he was also saying was like, the amount of energy you would require, I mean, in the way they were conceptualizing it currently, like the sort of, you know, where we're at, it's like to conceptualize a general intelligence, an AGI, would, and actually build one, it would have to use so much energy, like just absurd amounts of energy to even like generate one. And the thing about humans and biological life forms is that we've had millions of years to energy efficient, you like ridiculous, you can give so, me a potato and then I can run them out. So here's, here's one of the things yeah, once, slowly, once, you, once you hit takeoff, right, is that once you have the ability to do research and development beyond the ability of a human, then the ability to create optimal computing substrate, optimally efficient energy creation systems, whether that's, you know, building a Dyson sphere around the sun, getting all the energy the sun produces or on a more earthly level just finding some way of doing fusion really efficiently yeah you know these are, all, all of those problems are solvable by an intelligence which is able to see yeah how this works in a way that we just can't see it we can't see the answers to these problems and you're talking about super intelligence which is able to see the answers to those problems but so we also would have never thought that half of the inventions of the world were never uh, were never feasible until, well, for sure. until one person yeah and we're talking about we talk, what we're talking about here is and actually to jump back to the bit about the bit of your brain that allows you to have this conversation being new is actually for a vast swathe of time after modern humans evolved we didn't really manage to do much better than sharp sticks and fire and it allowed us to survive but not much more and what it was the agricultural revolution that kicked it off and then the industrial revolution after those are the two big revolutions and we would say the third revolution being AI on that level of importance but what's, what's really happened once we started being able to settle down and you know build a static cultures where people could build up writing and stuff is we managed to keep the wisdom from generation to generation so Einstein if he was born in a cave would just have been a caveman you know, like it's only because we've been able to build up 
you know, many, many generations of knowledge <coughs> that we've got to where we are now. So, so it shouldn't, like, so it's it, not that we're individually all that great, it's so that we're able to keep the knowledge. In a way, it's not just generally, generally humans as a race is the same as one AI kind of super intelligence because they start off in the same kind of dumb place but eventually grow together as they learn and learn. And they actually have the same that they have the same pitfalls. So you're saying that there seems to be a lot more grim ends to AI than there is. It's much harder uh, to construct the bright exactly, future than the bad future. Yeah. yeah. Well, then it's but it's the same for us as humans. It's right. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah. I, I think you're absolutely spot on. Like this yeah. is this is the thing. Like I don't think you can divorce the AI emergence and how it will proliferate from an evolutionary process because all improvements are made by variation in selection. You'll have. I know you think that this one thing will take off and leave all the others behind, but I don't think that's how technology evolves. Like technology evolves, technology is an evolutionary process, and there will be the same variation of selection. And much like humans, the way they'll have all the pitfalls. We have, so, have all. It'll be a very analogous process. Well, so the way that a machine learning algorithm works is essentially evolution. It will try. You give it a problem, but you don't tell it how to fix the problem because if you tell it how to fix the problem, <laughs> you're immediately biasing it in favour of the pre-existing solutions that we have. This is how you end up with it using the interference from a soldering iron on the other side of the loop. Right. And it tries everything. That doesn't work. Try another one. And it will gradually whittle away at solutions until it finds the one that it, however many times it tries, it can't find a better one. And it is analogous to evolution. It's survival of the fittest. So it's literally so, in a way that the entire base of the algorithm is like trial and error. And that's what machine learning is. Yeah. yeah. Which is yeah. how Everything else exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's really it just happens right. enormously faster. Yeah, it's just the scale of it is, is what, the scale of it is what's different. Instead of dealing with millions of years, you're dealing with seconds. Yeah. yeah. But, but you see, we can, we can now change ourselves very, very quickly as well. Like, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering how much it's going to shoot away in a way that we can't recognize because we're trying to improve ourselves too. Yeah, the, you know, the, we, the our, nature of our, our behaviour is determined, as we've discussed, like by culture, we can change that in an instant, if only we have the mental freedom to yeah. do so. So actually we can change our behaviour and improve ourselves overnight as well. This is the so nature I mean, of the takeoff, though, this is the nature of exponentiality. Is it, exponential curves are very difficult to understand because we think in a linear way, and like, it's very tempting to think, well, 20 years from now, the world will be about as different as it was 20 years ago, you know, I can remember 20 years ago. But that's completely wrong, because if you look at any number of different measures of human progress, we are on an exponential curve right now. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, if you look at GDP for the last 60,000 years, it's, the graph is like that. It's zero, and then it's shitloads. Um, <laughs> they so might not eventually hit a stopping point, though, in, in terms of the, the world that the humans have built. Yeah. It can only ever go as far as we've built it, because it's, it's without a physical body to actually... Oh, well, this is this is things okay. or whatever. Then how does it go any further? Well, no, but it, it, so it's, it does it it does have a way of interacting with the real world because you know let's take an example where I mean, what's a good example? Like so, it works out how how nanotech works, and it you know mails some stuff to some laboratories which will produce a set of gene folding bits and bobs for them, which are commercially available in seventy two hours, and it gets them sent to a lab where it sends some instructions to a guy to perform a series of operations on it. And at the end of that series of operations, it's got self-replicating nanobots that someone's made for it in a lab in Indonesia, just following its instructions. So use us and then he opens the jar and poof, they're out, and that's it. So it use us as the means. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. It, would have, it would have access um, potentially to, to to hack any kind of manufacturing process. Or yeah, and to pose yeah, no, to pose as a human. Yeah, it's more yeah, just like or, it without the or, humans actually being like. No, no. Yeah, but this is part, this, this is this is part of the thing. It's, yeah. it's it's socially far more manipulative than any human can be. Yeah. So it understands the way that people work far more than people do. Yeah. So. Did you meet Donald Trump? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I mean, that's the, the you know that's the, the kind of classic how you wipe out humanity thing is you you get a nanobot. Swarm made in a test tube without it ever being obvious to anyone that you've invented that technology. You know. Once it's out, they find their way around the world until you're ready for the moment, and then you activate them all at once, and everyone just drops dead. <laughs> the world starts being transformed into a big computer. Yeah, everyone yeah, drops dead. Sounds like an episode of Fear's Change. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, I feel like there was an Avengers movie to do this. <laughs> Yeah, it's, but that's the, that's the movie thing, isn't it? Is that there is no there is no way of fighting that. Have, have you seen that Black Mirror? They literally do clone a person and put them in a box, and it's like this person. They basically make a copy of you, and then they put them like they're just like a, a little AI slave, 
who right. just like is like you know hologram oh, yes, on the yeah, counter, yeah, yeah, yeah. but they're just they you know they're basically just trapped in this box with their human level intelligence with emotions and stuff, right. and then and they you know they can just be like hi mini me like turn on the lights and put the microwave on, but like it's trapped in this like yeah. slave. That, so that, that that that's the ethics of the box situation. If if what we suggested is right, that you can't have this Oh, well, thing yeah, I mean, we're, we're looking at the ethics entirely in one direction. Like, the only way to safely have a super intelligent AI is to never interact with it, to leave it completely isolated in the box. As soon as you interact with it, you're giving it the opportunity to get out. And the ethics of that are potentially catastrophic, right? And you're dealing with something that, that is thinking millions of times faster than you are. Absolutely, yeah. So it's yeah. for, every, for every week that you're experiencing, it's experiencing thousands of years in the box. You know, so that's literally the episode of Black Moon. Is it? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That's 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 it. He's like, she's like, I don't want to do what you're saying. He's like, well, here, take twelve weeks. Mm. And she's just like, let me out. Give me a task to do. It's awful. Mm. <laughs> but I mean, there's a clock speed thing here as well. You know, it isn't a direct. You know, it's not a direct thing, but you know, I think. Did I mention this before? Yeah, I think yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, but, you yeah. know, the speed that your neurons fire compared <laughs> to the speed that computers fire. So even a human level AI that was running on a faster substrate. So, uh, would be living for thou would be achieving thousands of years of thought for or every week. Or so we don't know how, yeah. the, how synapses work and how they sort of they don't, they're not linear. No, we haven't we it's haven't not. we haven't got a complete model yet. But you know, I mean, the, and the whole brain emulation thing. But it might not hurt. So it might, might, might not be the key. It's quite a long way away. How mega hurts? No, no, it's true. It's not. It's not a completely. You know, it's not analogous 100. percent But the the point remains that the digital processing runs potentially much, much faster than the wet way it does. And also it's not limited to three pounds of fat in a bone case. Mm. You know, and three trillion connectors or whatever it is, you can have as many as you like, no random number. Yeah. That's wicked. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah.